All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about a girl named Susie. And I'm going to give you a couple of situations, and I want you to tell me what you think Susie should do, okay? So one day, Susie went to the store to get some bread with her mom. And she paid the cashier, but the cashier gave her too much money back. What do you think she should do with it? Should she keep the money? She should give it back? Yeah. Now, what if Susie went to the fair and she found somebody's wallet on the floor and it had $100 in it? Had a lot of money. What should she do with that? Tell your dad? Yeah, give it back. All right, good. So what would God want us to do? Would he want us to keep the money? Or would he want us to be truthful and give it back, right? So every day we're faced with decisions that test our honesty. And the amount of money that Susie found wasn't important, but it was a question of doing what was right and what God would want us to do. So Jesus said that when, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with a lot. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So we said that God would want us to be honest and turn in the money. And even though it would be nice to have some extra money to buy toys or clothes, as servants of God, we know that we need to be honest and follow what he would have us do. So if you can make sure that you're, we are honest and serve God in all the small things in life, then we can be sure that we'll be honest um, in the big things that happen in life. Okay? So let's do a little prayer. Dear God, Help us to remember what Jesus taught us about honesty and help us to be honest in every situation, whether it's big or small. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you say amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Eternal God, we listen now for your word not just words written down on a piece of paper, but words that you speak to our hearts, and not just words that we hear a preacher say, but the words that we hear our Lord say in our ears, the ears of our spirits. Help us to hear, Lord, for we want to hear, in Christ we pray. Amen. The scripture text for today comes from Luke 16, verses 10 through 15. And I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version this morning, primarily because of the way this version translates the Greek word mammona. That word has been given a transliteration in some versions of the Bible and just simply called mammon, a word that nobody has ever heard before. I think this is the only text in which that word ever appears um, in daily life. In other versions of the Bible, it has been translated as money. The actual Greek translation has to do with wealth or riches. And in our culture today, wealth and riches have to do with more than just money. It has to do with the accumulation of the world's goods, which could require money, but not necessarily, depending upon how we accumulate such things as herds of animals or property. In the passage in Luke's Gospel, Jesus demonstrates his knowledge of human nature when it comes to our ability to serve the master of wealth, but also our professed desire to serve the master, our Lord. What was true of human nature 2,000 years ago remains true of human nature today. Jesus' words to the disciples and the Pharisees come echoing down to us through the centuries as we hear Jesus speaking these words in our ears. It is almost as if Jesus holds up 
a divine mirror in which we can see our true reflection if we are honest enough and if we are brave enough. Luke 16, 10 through 15. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. So he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. In this passage, Jesus contrasts faith with dishonesty and worldly wealth with heavenly wealth. We must always remember that when Jesus is teaching, what he says has a double meaning, a literal meaning and a spiritual meaning. I've asked Troy to leave the scripture reading on the screen just a little bit longer because I want you to look especially at verse 11 and the term dishonest wealth. Jesus is not talking about wealth that is gained through trickery or thievery here. The Greek word that is translated as dishonest has to do with sinfulness. The kind of wealth that this world has to offer is tainted with sin just as everything else in this world is tainted with sin. This world and everything in it, including us, is imperfect, impure, and separated from God. We may gain much worldly wealth by totally honest means, and we may manage it with great faithfulness as God would have us do. But compared to the true wealth, earthly wealth is imperfect and impure. Jesus does not condemn the accumulation of worldly wealth by honest means. In fact, he says how we manage earthly wealth has bearing on our being given the true wealth. We live our faith when we faithfully manage the earthly, worldly wealth that God gives us. And Jesus says, those who are faithful over a little will be faithful over much wealth, and they will be faithful over the true wealth if they are faithful with dishonest wealth. True wealth is different from the wealth of this world. True wealth is heavenly wealth. 
It is not only that place in heaven that Jesus created for us, as he said he would do, but it is also our ability to have communion with him now in this life, here on earth. And it is the spiritual gifts that God gives us. These gifts are powerful for the work of bringing in the kingdom of God as long as they are used faithfully for that purpose. And here, faithful means using them in a way that is full of faith. Here it does not mean predictably or reliably. Paul mentioned several of these gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 13, 3. He listed deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues, prophetic powers, knowledge of divine mysteries, faith strong enough to remove mountains, and generosity. It would be very destructive to give these gifts to those who cannot use them faithfully. Then Paul says, but the greatest of these is love. The Greek word here for love is agape, that selfless, self-giving, unconditional love, godly love. It is the kind of love Jesus wanted from Peter after the resurrection. It is the kind of love that God gives us now and the kind of love that God wants us to give God in return. We are ready to receive true wealth when we can accept that we need to be given true wealth and when we can be faithful over true wealth. And Jesus adds, anyone who is faithful over a little will be faithful over much. Faith is a gift that we receive from God. Receiving it from God requires humility and a willingness to accept that we must receive it from God, that we cannot create faith on our own. Having received faith and acting through faith, we are faithful over the worldly wealth that God gives us. Likewise, we will be faithful over the true wealth that God gives us. Recognizing and accepting that we are dependent on God for all we have is perhaps the key element in receiving true wealth and in managing all wealth faithfully. Human nature fights that acceptance. Human nature says we are the ones who are responsible for accumulating wealth. We are to work hard, study hard, work at a lucrative profession. We are responsible for building up our faith. And we are the ones who get to use all the wealth that we accumulate for our 
needs. And as we go about building that wealth, we become increasingly dependent on it. In a way, worldly wealth becomes an addiction, our little nest egg makes us feel successful and capable of making it in this world. But in order for us to continue to feel confident and secure, that little nest egg must grow continually, getting bigger and bigger. We need to earn more money, acquire more property, invest our wealth so that it increases in amount. And only as our worldly wealth continues to build, do we continue to feel successful and secure in our world. In this scenario, worldly wealth is a sort of God that supplies our material and non-material needs. We do whatever that worldly wealth taskmaster demands, and it does become our taskmaster. That is what Jesus is talking about when he says you cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve the master of worldly wealth and the master of true wealth. That is what the rich young man realized when he could not sell all of his possessions and give to the poor, much to his sorrow. He just didn't get, he didn't grasp what true wealth was all about. He didn't get what it meant to follow Jesus. We live in a culture that is absolutely dependent on worldly wealth. That's why it is no exaggeration to say money makes the world go round. To what extent does our need for and acquisition of worldly wealth make our world go round. Are we so dependent on worldly wealth that it takes up the majority of our thought time and our efforts? On the other side of the matter, how aware are we of spiritual wealth. How aware are we of the wealth that is meant for us just as much as it was meant for the people of Paul's day? I wonder, assuming that we are aware of all that spiritual wealth that is meant for us, I wonder if we see it as a nice add-on a nice add-on to the rest of our lives, or perhaps do we see it as evidence of religious extremism that could get in the way of our accumulating worldly wealth? The core of the matter comes down to this question, on whom or on what? Are we absolutely dependent on whom or on what are you and me absolutely dependent? Might we perhaps think of our life in God's kingdom as a sort of side venture that does not relate to our main goal in this life. 
Life in God's kingdom will become important only when we're not on this earth. It's there because we are entitled to it. And we are entitled to it because we profess belief in Jesus the Christ. The riddle of life that we each must answer for ourselves is how our goal relates and relates us to life in these two different kingdoms. It is not hard to imagine what life looks like when worldly wealth is the taskmaster. So let's spend a moment or two imagining what life would be like if God is the master and spiritual wealth is what we seek. First of all, if you have an appointment book, get it out and open it to the upcoming week, whatever you've got in it for the upcoming week. What would you put in it if the master that you serve is God? Literally. God is the one that you serve each day. Literally. What would you need to do? And what would you need to put in that appointment book? The first need that comes to mind is that we probably would want to make an appointment with God to discuss the plan for the day, perhaps for the week. If God is the one I serve, then I need to know his directions. There is a project to initiate and then to complete. The big question is, what is the project? And how are you going to find out if you don't ask? But there are other questions as well. You might ask, once I have begun the project, where am I in the process of completing it? What do I need in order to complete this project? Perhaps I hit a snag and I need God to tell me how I get past that snag. Most likely I will need to schedule several meetings with God throughout the week and I may need to schedule conferences with other people that God has brought in to help on the same project. Perhaps I will need to set aside some time to do some reading having to do with aspects of the project or with skills that I need to hone in order to be more effective in my work on this project with God. To what extent does the appointment book reflect that God is the master of our lives? The questions are much the same as we would ask for earthly tasks if we were serving the master of worldly wealth. But the project is vastly different and the master, when our master is God, is totally different. Another thing to look at is the financial statement. And your question might be, if I am serving God, what must the budget book, the checkbook ledger, the bank statement, the investment portfolio look like? 
God certainly has given us a good share of worldly wealth. With God as the master I serve, how do I faithfully manage that worldly wealth? What is the priority that God would place on that wealth that God has given me? One thing that must be considered is how I am using the worldly wealth God has given me to complete the project that my master, God, has given me to do. That project is devoted to accomplishing God's work. So the assets that I have need to be available for that project. Well, Augustine was right when he said we live in two cities, the city of God and the city of earthly wealth. We do indeed live in two cities and we do indeed live in them simultaneously. That is what makes our lives challenging and that is why we cannot take the living of our lives for granted and just go pell-mell through life. We do live in these two cities simultaneously and they do have two different task masters. Jesus was absolutely right when he said you cannot serve earthly wealth and God. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will worship the one and despise the other. We must choose who we serve. And Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. Amen. <coughs> Let us stand and say together what we believe using the Apostles' Creed this week. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.